just, the righteous, will live by faith. God promises redemption, so we trust it. We embrace God and what God does. That's the only way everyone is in us. Abraham showed us the way. He is our spiritual father. Jesus Christ made the way. He is our Savior. So, the just, the righteous, will live by this faith. As we worship, let us put our faith in Christ. This morning's scripture reading is from Romans. Five verses one through five. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Mr. Thank God. Thank you, Quiet. We go in prayer. <laughs> Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. For you are a rock and our redeemer, in whom we give our thanks and our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, first week, first week we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Second week, right? Last week. We've all sinned, and we continue to struggle with sin, and we are continuing to work it out with God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness that he gives at our disposal. We have a sin problem, but Jesus Christ solves our sin problem. And now, this week we come across one of the core tenets of our post-Jesus resurrection church faith. How do we become saved? While this question has often separated the church into many denominations and different things for different reasons, I believe that instead it can be an opportunity to bring us together. We agree that Jesus Christ is our only Savior. And we know that only Jesus Christ can unify. You may remember the story back in Acts 4, 7 through 12. Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin when the Sanhedrin leader asked, by what power or what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, O oh, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today, for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are now being asked how we healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom by the way he crucified, 
of whom God raised from the dead. That this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that you builders rejected. And that stone has become the cornerstone. Salvation then is found in no one else, for there is no under name under heaven given to humankind by which we must be saved. The Sanhedrin was not happy with his answer, but Jesus remains our justification. Let's take a look at what that means. Because if we think about it, this is incredibly, incredibly good news. And our theme for today is simply then that when we believe and confess our faith in Jesus Christ, that penalty is paid. And when we believe and confess in Jesus Christ, we are justified then by that faith. And that's even our verse today as it puts it, right, in Romans 5, 5, that faith. That hope in Jesus Christ will never, never put us to shame. So with that in mind then, let's follow the verses and see where we find it. Starting with verse 1, therefore since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just half of that sentence we realize. But because of Jesus and our belief and confession of our sin, our relationship with God has been restored. What we unrestored back in Genesis has now been restored by what? Faith. Our faith. Please note, it does not say anywhere in the book, do all the right things, be all the right ways, and then get perfectly holy, and then God will reconcile with you. That's like washing your hands to wash your hands. It's a little redundant. And probably missing the point. We don't work for our faith in Christ. We accept our faith in Christ. Now, in a most of the other religions that are out there, that is the opposite. Their systems are based on human beings being better enough, good enough, whatever, enough. Get better and God may love you someday. But instead, Christianity says, yes, you have the opportunity to get better. But that can't be earned. When you accept the faith fact that God already loves you, for us is the original originator of everything. God's grace and God's love always comes first. Always did. Always will. Our acceptance is always second. <clears throat> yes, once we believe, then renewal and revival and regeneration take place, right? Because we want to do everything possible in our lives to become more holy and righteous, living out the commandments of Christ to become more and more like Christ. That's Methodism 101. But the whole opportunity only happens, right? Because God knew we were going to blow it in the first place. From the Garden of Eden until now, the only chance we've ever had at a restored relationship with God, at a restored peace, at a restored anything in our lives, started with God and not with us. And then we just got done reading Romans 1 through 3, right? When if we didn't realize yet that we've blown it, it definitely shows that we've blown it and how much that we continue to when we don't follow the plan and will that God has given us for our lives. But then, Romans 
Romans 4, it shows up. And Romans 5, it shows up. And they remind us that even though we do it and continue to blow it over and over again, for some strange reason, and maybe only God can understand, God still loves us. So God still offers us his creation, a restored, peace-filled relationship, the exact moment we accept Jesus Christ by faith that will continue not only throughout our lives here, but also for our eternities there. It's just that big of a thing. Justification by faith, believing in and confessing our sin to Jesus Christ, gives us the peace with God that God wanted to share with us, even as far back as our creation. And through that faith, something amazing happens. We then gain access to God. So check out verse 2. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we've gained access to God that we just didn't have before. What does this access look like? Well, I think Philippians 4, 6, and 7 help us out. And there are verses we may remember. Because I think they define what peace with God access is. You may remember the words. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then, what is the next three words, if you remember? And then the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding. Well, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I don't know, maybe we need to think about this peaceful access to God a little bit more and his peaceful access to his grace as well for that same moment. Not only do we get all the God-given graces like preventing grace that comes before it and justifying grace like we're talking about today that saves us, and sanctifying grace that continues to sustain us and transform us so that we will one day be glorified in heaven with God also because of God's willingness to be accessible to us here and now. What this also means then is that the believer has all power, privilege, and position of being called a child of God. Because we believe and follow Jesus Christ, you have access to God. I have access to God. We have access to God that we just didn't have before. If we send God a note that says we're waiting in the hallway, God will stop everything to let us in. And that's all a perfect lead in. The verses 3 and 4 that then explain because of our faith, we look at everything in the world just a little bit differently, especially when we're going through suffering. Because we know that we're not going through it alone. God is there with us. So not only do we have the peace of God, right, from verse 1, and not only do we have access to God, verse 2, Verse 3 now reminds us, we also glorify in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. What this means is incredibly simple. We could have chosen in the Garden of Eden way back then, but we didn't. So we're living out the consequences of Adam and Eve's 
poor decision making and even poor rationalizations since. But because we have been justified by faith, we know this isn't how the story ends. Everything God intended Eden to be will be everything heaven will be and more. So we make each day here a training day for our eternal life there. We suffer differently here to produce good things there. We know that life can be incredibly difficult. It can be tremendously unfair. Suffering, loss, and pain are something that we've all had to deal with at one time or another. But our suffering, loss, and pain in this life are never experienced in vain. In fact, Paul even says that we glory in them. Really, Paul. Glory. You couldn't find another word. Glory. Yes. And here's why. When we go through anything, we learn a little something. Right? When we go through anything, we get a little bit wiser. We get a little bit deeper. And we become even more useful to ourselves, probably, but also to our family and to others who may be going through what we are or have experienced. I like how 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says it. Note the word glory is in there. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. One more time. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I understand that that's a different letter to a different church, but it's the same idea. And not only is it the same idea, but it's also the same promise. That even when our sufferings may be anything but light or momentary, thank you, Paul, they're not going to mess up our glory in God plans. And that even in the midst of them, we're going to give God the glory even in our sufferings because we know that any suffering produces this lasting perseverance. And that lasting perseverance, well, that's going to build some character. And yes, then that suffering, that perseverance, and that character will then manifest in itself as a supernatural, God-given hope that will never fail. We'll skip to verse 4 or 5 in just a minute, but believe me, just hang on that for a moment. There's a process here, and when we believe and are justified by faith, we just know that we do everything differently, including suffering, because we know that God can use anything to help us become more like Christ as we provide comfort, healing, peace, when they are needed the most. We look at everything a little bit differently. When we get the opportunity, even in our sufferings, we will give God glory for it all. And then that's where verse 5 comes in. Paul continues his celebration of God's hope. He starts off by just saying it produces hope, but then he gets on this wagon, right, that I mentioned earlier. He says, and that God-given, never-failing hope does not put us to shame 
because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So what is this hope then? What's the hope that never diminishes? It's a hope that never expires. It's, it's a hope that never fades. It's a hope that is eternal to each believer. And then Paul continues from verse 5 and verses 6 through 9 and explained how this hope is connected both to God's love and to what Jesus did on the cross because of God's love. You see, at just the right time, Paul wrote, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have been now justified, as that word again, by his blood, by his sacrifice, by the hope that he's bringing to us, how much more then shall we be saved from God's wrath through Jesus Christ. Did you hear the hope in there? Did you hear God's love in there? I hope you did. I don't want you to miss the point. We are justified not because we did anything right. We are justified because Jesus Christ did everything. Right. And yes, that is still that Romans 1, we are not ashamed. We are not ashamed. Now, if we're honest, there are times in our lives when shame is evident. We know this. People let us down. We often let ourselves down. So we try our best to admit to that mistake, and then try to make things right. And then to move forward with some sense of reconciliation, if possible. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, you will never have to make excuses for him. We will never have to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He is already our reconciliation. He was our reconciliation from the day of creation and before. Read the first chapter of John. He is already our peace. He is already our hope. He is will never leave us or forsake us. And yes, he has never, nor will he ever let us down. This hope that we have in Jesus Christ will never put us to shame. This hope Jesus Christ will never put us to shame. Instead, as the second verse said, if you remember in Romans 5, it even says there that when that day comes, we will boast in the hope of the glory our takeaway message. As we get back to it, going through Romans, please understand that justification is a courtroom term that says even though we're guilty, if we have belief and have faith in Christ, God our judge will judge us for giving. 
we are justified only by that thing. I generously say it well. Justification is a sure trust and confidence that Christ died for my sins. And he loved me and gave himself for me. To which we simply respond. <clears throat> Indeed. And of course, amen. Five chapters down, 11 chapters to go. We enjoy you, Craig. Gracious God, thank you. <laughs> Just thank you. There's nothing that we've done deserve your grace and your love, but yet your grace and your love exceeds all the generations and all of our expectations. And for Jesus who took our place and who gives us now access to your love and to your grace, we also thank you. in your spirit. So that those who do not believe yet will do so. Use us, we pray, in any way, in any way, to make it Jesus, then we pray. Amen.